This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Brilliant, a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like an engineer. In our quest for clean and cheap energy, massive solar and wind farms have sprung up across the world. Investment in these renewable resources reached $273 billion in 2018. Include the eight previous years and that figure reaches $2.3 trillion. This is positive news for most, but many have been left asking, why not nuclear? After a quick examination of countries' carbon dioxide output per kilowatt hour of energy produced, it becomes clear that countries like France are currently doing better than countries like Germany in the quest to produce low carbon energy. France, with 61% of its electricity generation from nuclear, is producing just 32 grams of carbon dioxide for every kilowatt hour produced where Germany, a country that has invested billions into wind and is gradually closing down all its nuclear power plants and replacing them with natural gas plants and wind energy, is producing 318 grams of carbon dioxide for every kilowatt hour. It's perfectly understandable why many advocate for nuclear energy over renewables. Wind itself releases less carbon dioxide for every kilowatt hour of energy it produces at about 11 grams just under nuclear's 12 grams per kilowatt hour. But because wind is intermittent, it needs to be propped up by some form of power production that can quickly ramp up and produce electricity when the wind falls, and natural gas is the perfect solution for that, at a reasonable price. So in reality, wind isn't competing against nuclear energy, at least not directly. It's competing with larger, baseload power stations like natural gas, and to see why it's losing that battle, we need to dive into the world of economics to see why countries and investors are shunning nuclear energy. When choosing where to invest money in infrastructure, there are several factors you need to consider. Risk, potential gain, and the time it will take to get a return on investment are the most important. This is an extremely simplified example of a return on investment calculation for two power plants, a 1000 megawatt nuclear power plant and a 1000 megawatt natural gas power plant. This calculation is based on the wonderful video on the Illinois Energy Professor YouTube channel, which I will link in the description below. When making this kind of calculation, we have a few variables we need to consider. The cost of construction, the fuel cost, and the construction time are the biggest variables that differ between the two energy sources. The average cost of construction for a nuclear power plant is a difficult number to pin down. The number varies widely from project to project, ranging from 5,500 per kilowatt to 8,100 per kilowatt. We will assume a lower price of 6,000 per kilowatt, resulting in a price tag of 6 billion for a 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant. Natural gas, on the other hand, is one of the cheapest types of power plants to construct, with a cost of about $920 per kilowatt. So a 1,000 megawatt power plant would cost 0.92 billion. But let's just round that up to 1 billion for simplicity's sake. Now, I know you already see the problem. Natural gas is just cheaper, and it's going to take the nuclear power plant longer to recoup that cost. This becomes even more of a hare and tortoise race as a result of the construction time of each. The average nuclear power plant takes six years to construct, whereas your typical natural gas power plant takes about two years to construct. This becomes a particular issue when borrowing and interest rates are involved. We are going to assume an interest rate of 3% and a repayment term of 25 years for both plants, and both will borrow in $1 billion increments. $1 billion on a 25-year repayment plan and a 3% interest rate equates to a $56.7 million payment every year. Here, we will borrow an idea from the Illinois Energy Professor and illustrate profit and loss with blocks. Below the x-axis, these blocks represent debt. Above the line, they represent profit. We will place nuclear's profit and loss on the left side of the graph and natural gases on the right. Each full block unit, like this, represents $56.7 million. These blocks can be partially filled to represent smaller fractions. We are using this to bring the vast quantities of money involved into a more human scale. Let's begin. In the first year of construction, both plants will generate one unit of loss, as both borrowed one billion. In the second year, the nuclear power plant borrows another billion, so it now owes the bank double the repayment. 
so it now has a total of 3 units of loss. Natural gas does not borrow another billion, so it just needs to pay off the current 1 unit of debt owed yearly, for a total of 2. The natural gas plant is now complete. It took 2 years. It can now begin to generate revenue to turn that loss into a profit. Now we need to calculate revenue. Both are 1000 megawatt facilities, meaning if they both run for an hour, they will both generate 1000 megawatt hours of energy. Calculating revenue from this number is not straightforward, as the energy marketplace is complex. Grid operators may buy a large percentage of nuclear's base load out in advance for a set price, as it can't turn itself off easily. It needs to continually run, and electricity prices drop in the middle of the night as demand falls. Energy prices constantly fluctuate, so it makes sense for nuclear power plants and the grid operators to agree on a bulk price. Whereas, the natural gas plants can operate as peaking plants, shutting down during the night and only operating during the evening when electricity demand and prices are at their peak, allowing them to fetch a better price for their electricity, thereby losing less money on operation and maintenance of their plant and getting the maximum profit out of their fuel spend. Factor in transmission costs as energy is lost to power lines, taxes and all the other messy factors, and it becomes even more difficult to calculate earning figures. This calculation will be inaccurate. We will make a massive assumption and assume they will both earn the same amount at 525 million a year after all these deductions are made. So, in its third year, the natural gas plant will have a revenue of nine and a quarter of these blocks. After our loan repayment, that will be eight and a quarter blocks of profit. But there is another large deduction we need to consider that differs greatly between these power plants. Fuel costs. Here, nuclear has one big leg up. Its fuel is relatively cheap, just by virtue of only needing a very small amount in comparison to natural gas. A single uranium fuel pellet with a diameter of an AA battery has the potential to release the same amount of energy as one ton of coal or half a ton of natural gas. A little goes a long way. To run the 1000 megawatt facility for an entire year, you would need about $64 million worth of fuel, or 1.1 currency blocks. To produce the same amount of electricity, the natural gas facility would need about $450 million worth of fuel, or 7.9 currency blocks. These prices will also fluctuate, but again, this calculation is simply for illustrative purposes. So, once up and running, the nuclear power plant can produce more electricity for less money. Factoring that in, the natural gas plant will make $525 million of revenue, deduct both loan payments and fuel costs, and we are left with about one third of our currency units of profit. On to year three. The nuclear power plant borrows another billion, and so now owes three units of loan payments for a total of six in loss. The natural gas plant, however, makes one third of a unit, which is removed from our loss. Year four, the nuclear power plant borrows another billion and adds four units of loss. The natural gas plant removes another one third of a block. Year five, nuclear borrows another billion and adds five units of loss. The natural gas plant removes another one third of a block. Year six, nuclear borrows its final billion and adds six units of loss. The natural gas plant removes another one third of a unit. Finally, the nuclear power plant is finished and will begin generating revenue in year 7. Deducting the loan payments and fuel costs leaves us with 2.2 units of profit. Even with the huge loan repayments, which will be paid off completely in 24 years, the nuclear power plant is making far more profit per year, but it has a long way to go in reversing this loss. Year 7, Year 8. The natural gas plant has now broken even. Year 9, Year 10, Year 11, Year 12, Year 13, Year 14, Year 15, Year 16. The nuclear power plant has now broken even and even made a profit. Year 17, Year 18, Year 19, Year 20. Okay, you get the picture. Over the long term, the nuclear power plant is insanely profitable, but the risk involved in reaching that profit is huge. Politicians and investors alike are hesitant to put their money on the line when six years in there is $1.2 billion of loan repayments made, with no revenue on the books. With the first six years of loan repayments alone, you could have built another natural gas plant. That's insane. 
Did the company take out another loan to pay for the loan payments? Financing these things is difficult. Getting that money from politicians is hard too, because most politicians aren't going to think about long-term energy strategy. Because something that won't start producing electricity for 6 years and won't turn a profit for 16 is not in their interest. They will need to be voted back into office before then. Factor in that nuclear power plants have a terrible track record for running not only over budget, but over time, resulting in an even larger run into negative before revenue begins and nuclear energy just becomes a really difficult investment to justify. That's why they are falling out of favour before even discussing the safety issues. Looking at these numbers, you would never expect a nuclear power plant operator to decide to shut an operational plant down. Yet, that's exactly what's happening in many places. Take the Diablo Canyon power plant in California. This power plant is run by Pacific Gas and Electric, a company with a diverse portfolio of energy generation, hydroelectric, nuclear, natural gas and renewables. They are an investor-owned and publicly traded company. Maximizing profit is their prerogative. Yet, they have decided to close down the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant in 2024 when its 40-year license expires. Why would they do that? Well, that's complicated. First, in order to renew their license, they needed to modernize the entire facility at a cost they deemed too high. They needed to change their cooling system from a once-through system where seawater is pumped through the facility for cooling and dumped back into the sea to a closed-cycle evaporative cooling system which used the same volume of water continually and thus reduced environmental impact. One particularly large cost was the cost of integrating appropriate earthquake protection after lessons learned from the Fukushima disaster where tsunami flood water destroyed emergency generators and caused three separate meltdowns and three hydrogen explosions. As much as nuclear advocates want to say nuclear is safe, which it can be, making it safe is expensive. PG and E themselves said the retrofit was too expensive and instead decided to shut the entire plant down. They decided it would make more economic sense to close this facility and replace it with renewables. This says a lot about nuclear energy economics, when even an existing plant can't compete. It's not just nuclear energy that is facing competition. Three hours north of Diablo Canyon, natural gas turbines were retired and replaced by battery storage. That's because California is producing so much excess solar energy that buying it and storing it in batteries to sell later makes economic sense. The energy marketplace is a complex machine and no one-size-fits-all approach can be used. We can get a clearer picture of these costs with an analysis method called Levelized Cost of Electricity or LCOE. The Levelized Cost of Electricity attempts to give a simple, comparable number that represents the cost a power plant will need to charge for a unit of energy in order to recoup its cost over the course of its lifetime. The equation looks like this, but putting it simply, it's the sum of costs over the lifetime of the plant divided by the total quantity of electricity that plant will generate and sell in its lifetime. Here, we can see that onshore wind, photovoltaic solar power and combined cycle natural gas are by far the cheapest forms of electricity and this is the real reason they are gaining larger market shares. For nuclear to rise to prominence once again, it needs to evolve. It needs to compete with the role natural gas is filling. It needs to be smaller, cheaper and safer. Ideally, the reactor should be dispatchable, meaning it can turn itself on and off so it can fit neatly into modern grids with high percentages of renewables. That's a difficult problem to solve, but people are working on potential solutions that could make nuclear energy competitive once again. We will discuss some of these solutions in future videos. Every 45 minutes, as much energy falls on Earth's surface as all of mankind uses in a year. We now have a way to capture that energy efficiently. Now we just need a way to fulfill our energy needs at night. Ensuring those in power make the right decisions requires voters who understand the energy market and solar technology platforms. A good place to start is Brilliant's excellent course on solar energy. It teaches you how much energy is available to extract from sunlight based on where you are and the composition of the atmosphere. Then you'll learn the thermodynamics and semiconductor concepts that enable the two main kinds of solar energy platforms, solar thermal power and photovoltaic cells. By the end of the course, you'll have a solid grasp on the relevant physics and a clear picture of how light beaming from the sun 
ends up as an electrical current streaming in your device. This is just one of many courses on Brilliant that will improve your ability to understand the world around you. You can set a goal to improve yourself and then work on that goal a little bit every day. Brilliant makes that easy with interactive explorations and a mobile app that you can take with you wherever you are. If you are naturally curious, want to build your problem solving skills, or need to develop confidence in your analytical abilities, then get Brilliant Premium to learn something new every day. Brilliant's thought provoking math, science and computer science content helps guide you to mastery by taking complex concepts and breaking them up into bite sized understandable chunks. You'll start by having fun with their interactive explorations and over time you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. As always, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Twitter, Instagram, Discord server and subreddit are below.